Like Anu said, this is, this is black innovators and entrepreneurs under capitalism. So th this, this talk is, is based on an essay I wrote many years ago for FEE, for the Foundation of Economic, Edu for Economic Education, their publication, The Free Men, I think it was known as Ideas on Liberty back then. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the structure of the talk is this. I want to start off with a few of the inspiring stories of the, of the, of the great black achievers, but I want to do much more than that in this talk. I, I, I want to discuss the terrible obstacles that have been, been overcome by the black heroes in, in this country, raise questions regarding the necessary and minimal conditions for, for a persecuted minority to rise, and then raise the question at the end, have black Americans lived under these conditions in America? Uh, if so, to what extent? And, 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 and if not, why not? Now, let's start off with, with one of the great black heroes who, who has gained at least some deserved recognition in this country, and, and, and that, of course, is, is Booker T. Washington, uh, who was born into slavery in, in Virginia in 1856. And Washington worked in, in, in the salt furnaces and, and coal mines in order to finance his education at, at, the, at the Hampton Institute. He's, he's famous, of course, he, he became the first leader of Tuskegee Institute when, the, when, the, when the, and eventually Tuskegee University, which was founded in 1881, and Booker T. Washington held that position at Tuskegee until his death in 1915. Now, aside from running Tuskegee Institute and turning it, in, turning it into an outstanding uh, educational center for, to develop the black mind, uh, Washington also worked endlessly to promote education amongst black Americans in other forms. Don't forget, this is Alabama, this Tuskegee's in Alabama. This is in the, in the Jim Crow era, late 19th, early 20th century. The, the, the racists who control the state legislatures put very little money or, or, or work into educating uh, black children. And so Washington worked tirelessly to raise money from white businessmen. Uh, millions and millions of dollars to fund the founding of, of, of schools for black, for black students throughout the Jim Crow South. Julius Rosenwald, the president of C.S. Roebuck, famously uh, donated millions to this cause, established the Rosenwald Fund to, to establish black schools in the Jim, Jim Crow South. Also, uh, Washington was able to raise money from George Eastman, the, the inventor of the Kodak camera and the fa founder of the Kodak Corporation, and also from various uh, corporate executives of Rockefeller's Standard, Standard Oil Company. Um, and with, with this money, Washington was able to, to, to establish some 5,000 schools throughout the uh, rural South to, to educate uh, young, young black children. Now, he's inspiring, one of his, he wrote several autobiographies. One of them, the inspiring Up From Slavery, became, became a bestseller in 1901. Washington is, I think, is recognized as one of the great educators that this country has ever produced. And one of many great things that, that he did in his career was he recognized the talent of George Washington Carver, who we shall uh, discuss in just a moment, hired him when Carver graduated from this, well, got his master's degree from the school that would eventually become Iowa State University, hired him to be a professor and a researcher at, at Tuskegee Institute, a position that, that Washington held uh, for, for, the, for the rest of his long life. And Washington involved in various disgruntlements and disagreements with other faculty members, Washington recognizing Carver's genius, who smoothed that over and kept Washington working at, at Tuskegee for the rest of his, of his long life. Uh, now we're going to see more about Booker T. Washington a little bit later when we discuss the, the kind of impediments and obstacles that racists place in the path of black achievement in this country. But for right now, let's move on to George Washington Carver. Uh, one, one, again, what, like, like Washington, one of the great black geniuses that has gained some recognition uh, in, the, in the United States and, and, and around the world. Nobody knows Carver's birth date for sure. It was sometime in the early 1860s. He also born into slavery in Missouri. Uh, his, his mother was kidnapped by, by racist night riders when he was, when he was a baby. Never, never saw her again, so he was, he was orphaned. Raised by the Carver family, uh, you know, a, a white family that were not racists, not 
uh, not slavery supporters, uh, recognize the, the young child's prodigious intellectual gifts, encourage, encourages education. There's a, there's, a story, there's a story they tell about Carver. I'm not sure if it's true or apocryphal, but it's because I've never been able to, to track it down. But it certainly could be true, given the anti-black prejudice that, that existed in the country in the late 19th century, that, that Carver was accepted, uh, one of his biographers says, at a, at a college in Kansas many miles from his home. Being poor, lacking car fare, he had to walk the many miles to get to the college. And when he introduced himself, the administrators saw that this, that this teenage kid was black, and they said to him, we're sorry, we, we didn't know you were black. We don't accept black students at, at, at this school. And he had a trudge, uh, according to his biographer, the many miles back to, to, to where he lived. Eventually accepted, I don't remember the name of the school in Iowa, it's the school that developed into Iowa State University where he graduated, he got his master's degree in agriculture, graduated in 1896, whereupon he received a letter from Booker T. Washington at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, uh, requesting his instructional uh, services. He spent the rest of his long life, he died in the early 1940s, uh, spent the rest of his long life uh, as a professor and agricultural researcher at Tuskegee Institute. He's most famous, of course, for developing sweet potatoes and peanuts as, as leading crops, but additionally created a new type of cotton uh, called Carver's Hybrid and made dozens of other agricultural innovations. He was one of the early scientists who recognized the need for and emphasized the principle of crop rotation. The cotton uh, de depletes, de depletes the soil of the, the, the nutrients the soil needs. The South, the, the South King cotton, of course, uh, was dominant. Uh, agricultural yields were declining year by year. Carver, one of the first to recognize that uh, peanuts and sweet potatoes would replenish the soil with the nutrients needed by cotton and, and themselves could be developed into cash crops and emphasize the, the principle of, uh, of crop rotation, enabling southern farmers, both white and, and black, to increase their, their yields. At his death, Carver, who was a lifelong bachelor, he was really married to science. He was a, he was a devoted uh, scientist, left his entire savings. All the money he had made at Tuskegee, not that he got paid that much there, but he never spent it. His biographer said he just took his checks and put them in his drawer. Uh, he's, you know, <laughs> the Edison, recognizing Carver's genius, offered him a job in Edison's laboratory in New Jersey for the salary of the princely salary of $100,000 a year, which I would, I would take today very happily. A hundred years ago, that was a lot of money. Carver turned him down, you know, respectfully turned Edison down, saying, at least according to one of his biographers, he said, well, what would I do with the money when I have all the world at my, uh, why do I need the money when I have all the world at my disposal? His, his passion was, of course, crops and, 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 and plants and, and uh, agriculture. So he donated his entire life savings to uh, a fund for scientists, and for his, his myriad achievements in, in the field of agriculture, he's generally recognized as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, agricultural scientist and agricultural innovator in, in history. Now, moving on here, um, Burton Folsom, the American historian, wrote a, a very good book called The Empire Builders uh, about the development of Michigan into a, into a leading industrial center in the mid-19th century. Uh, in 1850, Professor Folsom points out, Michigan created a state constitution that restricted the government's powers and left economic development largely in private hands. Based on its, its, its great degree of economic freedom, Michigan developed into one of the world's leading industrial centers. The most obvious example, of course, the rise of the automobile industry under you know, uh, productive giants like Henry Ford and, and Billy Durant, who started uh, General Motors. Um, now, not surprisingly, uh, Michigan offered uh, uh, numerous opportunities for black entrepreneurs. I'll just mention one. Elijah McCoy, for example. Elijah McCoy, McCoy was a mechanical engineer who initially worked for the Michigan Central Railroad as a locomotive fireman. But he had, had an extremely inventive and creative mind. He invented a revolutionary device to lubricate a, a machine's moving parts. He's like an Ayn Rand kind of hero. Uh, his product, the, the lubricator cup, 
made it possible to oil machinery while, while in operation. Now, to distinguish it from cheaper imitations and low-grade imitations, his product became known as the real McCoy. Now, some of us are old enough to remember that expression. I haven't heard, I haven't heard that expression much in recent years, but when I was a kid, they, you know, they, 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 the genuine, the real deal, the genuine article was, was referred to as the real McCoy, the currency of which comes from Elijah McCoy's uh, uh, invention. He obtained 51 additional patents, including an early version of an ironing board and, and, and a cup for imbibing medicine. Uh, he patented numerous automatic lubricators, and at age 77, at the, at, the, at the ripe young age of 77, he founded the Elijah McCoy Manufacturing Company in, in Detroit to make his various products. Now, one of the, the towering black innovators and entrepreneurs who unfortunately has, has very little recognition in, in the modern world is Sarah Breedlove. Now, Sarah Breedlove was born free in Louisiana in 1867, but being born in Louisiana is a hardship already, um, and especially if you're black. I'm glad you didn't laugh. That's not funny. She was orphaned at age seven, married at age 14, had a daughter at age 17, widowed at age 20. She worked as a washerwoman for a dollar a day, uh, to, to support her child's uh, formal schooling. She, she was interested in beauty and hair care. She developed cosmetic products for black women. Uh, when she married Charles Walker, she changed her name to Madam C.J. Walker and opened a, a beauty school that became hugely successful. She invented a hot comb, developed new shampoos and cosmetics, and is believed to be the first self-made female millionaire in history, period. And it's fascinating that, and I, this, this is a, 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 a referred to in several, uh, in numerous historic sources, that it's, it's and I, so I assume it's true, the first self-made female millionaire in history was a black American woman, Sarah Breedlove, Madam C.J. Walker. Uh, she taught and trained black women to build her own businesses. She lectured widely, donated to the NAACP, which was founded near the, near the end of her life, <clears throat> and was politically active to protest the lynchings and, and, the, and the white race riots that killed innocent blacks and destroyed black homes and businesses in numerous cities in the United States, including in the, not limited to the South, as we shall see. Now, Madam Walker is, is one of the most inspiring and unfortunately little-known American rags to riches story. This is a real Horatio Alger uh, story. But, but, but hers is not the only example of black entrepreneurs capitalizing on, on America's free, relative freedom uh, in the late 19th and turn of the 20th century periods. Some black businesses established in that era were hugely successful. For example, Entire towns and business districts of entrepreneurial blacks flourished in that era of U.S. history. Early in the 20th century, uh, black Americans established such new towns as Mount Bayou, Mississippi, Nicodemus, Kansas, Langston, Oklahoma, and others. Boley, Oklahoma, had a population of 4,000 at the turn of the 20th century. The town was governed and run by blacks, boasted, among other establishments, a bank, numerous grocery stores, five hotels, seven restaurants, a waterworks, an electric plant, four cotton gins, a bottling works, a telephone exchange, and a lumberyard. This was a prosperous uh, business community. <clears throat> Tulsa, Oklahoma, even more so. And Durham, North Carolina, even more so. Both had thriving black business centers. In, in the turn of the 20th century, Tulsa, this is, this is a, an inspiring and, and tragic story all rolled up into one. Uh, Oklahoma, of course, becomes a, a state in 1907. Uh, and in the years leading up, up to that, numerous whites from the South had moved into Oklahoma, including many who had been slave owners uh, prior to the Civil War. As soon as Oklahoma becomes a state in 1907, 
one of the, fir- one of the very first pieces of legislation passed uh, in the Oklahoma State Legislature are, s- are segregation laws, f- prohibiting, legally prohibiting blacks from uh, shopping in white stores, living in black neighborhoods, the Jim Crow laws in, uh, in Oklahoma. So it, in the early 20th century Tulsa, bigotry, uh, racial bigotry denied blacks access to the main business district, even as customers, never mind as entrepreneurs. Uh, so enterprising blacks turned the Greenwood section of Tulsa into a, into a bustling uh, business center. Numerous service industries thrived. N- numerous black doctors, dentists, lawyers, teachers, and other professionals ma- and, and tutors maintained offices there. And, and the neat homes of the middle class lined Detroit Avenue reflecting their business or professional success. Now we're going to see more about this. Now in Durham, Durham, in North Carolina, let's hear it from North Carolina, black entrepreneurs succeeded in manufacturing as well as in service industries, including one of the city's largest brick producing companies. Now here the good news is the white community was not hostile to black success. And white capitalists such as Washington Duke, the tobacco magnet for whom Duke University is named, and Julian Carr was successful in, in, the, in helping, uh, was helpful in the establishment of black businesses. In 1898, John Merrick and Dr. Aaron McDuffie Moore established the North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company, one of the largest and most successful uh, black enterprises in the history of American capitalism. Uh, a, f- a firm that 100 years later, in the late 20th century, would employ over 1,000 individuals and boast assets exceeding $200 million. In addition to 150 thriving businesses, Durham's black commercial district was home to an, interna- was home to an area internationally known as the Negro Wall Street, a collection of banks and insurance companies <clears throat> that represented, quote, one of the most dramatic examples of concentrated African, African-American financial might this country has ever produced, unquote. These financial institutions were so sound that they helped virtually every black business in Durham survive the Depression. Now, the fates of these black business strongholds are both shocking and revealing. The Greenwood District of Tulsa was burned to the ground by a mob of racist thugs in 1921 in a spree of, of destruction unrestrained by the legal system. I'm going to see more on this later, or soon. Durham's magnificent black business district was wiped out by federal and state urban renewal programs in the mid-1960s. But the good news here is Durham's black entrepreneurs made a comeback in the 1980s with the opening of several shopping malls and a number of, of, of manufacturing companies. Now, a despised racial minority needs political and economic freedom with their concomitant legal protection of individual rights even more than the, than the majority does in any society because the despised ethnic minority are potentially subject to vicious physical assault by racist thugs and, and, and mobs, which has happened to blacks repeatedly in American history. Even if, all con- even if all whites in the country were so irrational as to fear, hate, and shun blacks, such bigotry would still be insufficient to halt black economic progress if the rights of black ec- uh, individuals were legally protected. Under capitalism, of course, the purpose of the government is to protect individual rights, including property rights. Tragically, the Tulsa government failed to operate on, on this fundamental capitalist principle and let mobs of white looters just burn uh, the Greenwood section uh, to to the ground. The black producers of Tulsa did not need paternalistic government or even its goodwill, even its goodwill. They didn't even require an end to bigotry. The absolute bottom line minimal condition they did require was the protection of their legal rights as US citizens, uh, including their property rights, and their own enterprise took care of the rest. Similarly in Durham, The government didn't just fail to restrain thugs in Durham, the government itself violated the rights of these black property owners in their urban renewal programs. Uh, The absence of capitalism, of a government exclusively and scrupulously devoted 
to the protection of individual rights, was responsible for the destruction of these black business centers. When the government fails to protect individual rights, or itself violates them, there is no hope of economic advancement, especially for members of a persecuted ethnic minority. Statism, notice an important point here, statism is necessary to keep a racial minority oppressed. Statism is necessary to keep a racial minority oppressed. Under capitalism, most, most enterprising members of a minority group can overcome virtually any obstacle. Now, further proof of this principle is provided by black Caribbean immigrants. The United States received a sizable Caribbean immigration in the early 20th century, and by 1930, Caribbean immigrants constituted roughly 1% of the total U.S. black population. These immigrants, like virtually all immigrants to the United States, tended to be hardworking, entrepreneurial, and frugal. Based on the still significant elements of freedom in the American mixed economy of the, of the early 20th century, uh, many Caribbean immigrants opened and operated successful uh, businesses. A quote from Thomas Sowell here, himself a great example of a, of a, of a brilliant black mind who uh, achieved a very high level in the United States. I don't know how many uh, brilliant economists, I'm not sure how many books Professor Sowell has written. I have at least a dozen in my personal library. Here's a quote from one of my favorite Thomas Sowell books, Ethnic America. Uh, quote, as early as 1901, the, the Caribbean immigrants owned 20% of all black businesses in Manhattan, in New York City, although there were only 10% of the black population there, unquote. Despite the existence of anti-black prejudice in, in the country, by the 1980s, Caribbean immigrants had an average income roughly equal to, to white Americans, and the, the second generation, their children, had educational levels and living standards generally higher than average white American. Now, because racists recognize such cases as this, that, that the ethnic minorities they oppose will flourish under individual rights, and the political and economic freedom of, of capitalism, they conduct a relentless war against individual rights and the free market system. The antebellum South not only, not only created and supported a legal system of, of enslavement uh, of blacks, but also legally mandated that blacks be kept illiterate. Indeed, Thomas Sowell wrote, in this case in his book, Markets and Minorities, quote, Many southern states not only refused to educate free Negroes, but made it a crime for them even to attend private schools at their own expense, unquote. In the postbellum South, Jim Crow legislation made it illegal for blacks to attend the better schools, be hired for the best jobs, or live in white neighborhoods, regardless of the qualifications of any given in individual. Bigots know that without the coercive power of the state, to enforce their prejudices, they are powerless to prevent the advancement of an ethnic minority they fear. Capitalism is the biggest, worst enemy. That's a nice testimony to capitalism. Suppose that capitalism, we should wear that you know, on our foreheads, uh, you know, proudly on our foreheads. Capitalism is the biggest, worst enemy. It's like when the Ayatollah Khomeini referred to the United States as the great Satan. We're going to put that on our foreheads, too. You know, we're the great Satan. If it comes from Khomeini, it's got to be a compliment. Additional evidence here is, 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 is provided by the, by the varying rates of black economic progress over the past 60 years. Black Americans moved heavily into the northern cities, first during World War I, when a lot of white men were, were away at the, in, in the army at the war, and even more so, for the same reason, during World War II and the post-war years. The years between 1945, the end of the war, and President Truman and the conservative coalition in Congress gradually junking the various policies of, of the New Deal, uh, the, the, the years between 1945 and 1970, that 25 year period were a relatively free period of America's mixed economy. Now because the majority of blacks had lived in the Jim Crow South where legal restrictions impeded their advancement, the percentage of black families living below the government's official poverty line was appallingly high, uh, 87% in 1940. 
Now, in the freer north, with better schools and more jobs open to blacks, black rise into middle-class prosperity begins, really, during, during the World War II and post-war era. By 1960, just 20 years later, the number of poor black families had dropped from 87 to 47 percent in 20 years, and by 1970 to 30 percent. Then, of course, the welfare state really begins under Johnson and, interestingly, accelerates dramatically under Nixon. Then came in, in the 1970s, came massive government intervention in the form of the Great Society, uh, the Great Society Welfare State, which Marxist intellectuals and politicians directed heavily toward blacks because of their still disproportionate poverty. After 1970, expensive government programs proliferated, with increasing numbers of relatively poor urban blacks being seduced onto the dole. Walter Williams puts this very nicely. Right? Washington's welfare pimps, he calls them. Washington's welfare pimps seducing numerous urban blacks onto the dole. The result was predictable. Black economic progress slowed drastically. 29% of black families were below the poverty line in 1980, 26% in 1995. You see the slowing of, uh, of economic growth here. Today, in the early 21st century, though, good news, Roughly 50% of black, black Americans are middle class. More than 40% own their own homes. More than 30% live in the suburbs. Uh, given the rise of government intervention and the decline of freedom over the past 40 to 50 years, one can only wonder how much higher these figures would have been if the freedom of the earlier period had been allowed to continue or, or expand it. Now, there's a prevalent belief today that the success of, of blacks in America or any persecuted ethnic minority anywhere requires elimination of racism. This is an interesting question, I have a point. I'm not sure it's true. Uh, now, the, 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 the end, ending all forms of bigotry, all forms of ethnic bigotry, is an undiluted good towards which all rational human beings should strive. You could at least make a case that it is not a necessary condition of an, of an ethnic uh, or, or racial minority success. What is, bottom line, absolutely a necessary condition is the legal protection of individual rights, including the right to property provided by capitalism. Now, in the past, the fears of white racists explained the absence of recognition accorded to, to the great black innovators and entrepreneurs, a few of whom you know, we just discussed. But today, the status media and intellectuals claim to support black empowerment. What then is the current cause of the bizarre public silence regarding the entrepreneurial success of, of, of numerous black Americans? Why has almost nobody, almost nobody knows Sarah Breedlove, Madam C.J. Walker, the first self-made woman millionaire? Nobody knows who she is. Why? Notice that anti-Western, ostensibly pro-black intellectuals have promulgated the myth that Western civilization is a stolen legacy of, of African culture. In the name of black pride, they relentlessly push this fantasy while ignoring magnificent black achievers right under their noses. Why? Why? Because their prejudices, essentially Marxist, uh, prevent them from acknowledging the existence of successful black capitalists. In the mythical essentially Marxist universe they inhabit, white Western capitalists are exploitative of the poor, the minorities, and the third world. An entire class of successful black American entrepreneurs is worse than impossible in their view. It shatters the Marxist delusions they cling to and brings them face to face with the enormous benevolence of the principle of individual rights and free markets. In the name of justice, the prejudices of both white racists and Marxist intellectuals must be swept aside so that we can recognize the life-giving uh, uh, benevolence of individual rights and capitalism. Now, I, I, I wanted to do more in this talk than just discuss some of the great black achievers in, in the United States. I wanted to discuss the terrible obstacles uh, that they faced and, and, and overcome and raise deeper questions uh, uh, on, on this issue. Now, 
I want to start with the theory that leads to the, the oppression of, of, of blacks in the United States and then move to the racist practice. So it tells a true story here. Uh, Booker T. Washington, I said I was going to come back to, to Washington. Washington by 1901 was recognized as, as, as a great educator. Tuskegee Institute was, was gaining recognition as a, as a, a serious uh, school for, for black higher education. In 1901, Washington's biography, Up From Slavery, which is a terrific book, uh, became a bestseller. Based on his achievements, President Theodore Roosevelt invites Washington to dinner at the White House. The first time uh, a, a black man had been invited as a guest to, to, to dine with the president in the White House. Now, you can imagine what happens in, 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 in 19... Maybe you can't. Uh, the, the political reaction. This dinner takes place. Washington has dines with President Roosevelt, a Republican, of course, you know, in the, in the White House in, in 1901. Now, racists across the country are outraged. Democrats very predictably, but even some Republicans. Now, listen to this, this quote. This is, here's a quote from James Vardaman, prominent politician in and future governor of the illustrious state of Mississippi. Vardaman says, quote, the White House is so saturated with the odor of that nigger that the rats have taken refuge in the stable. I am just as much opposed to Booker T. Washington as a voter as I am to the coconut-headed, chocolate-colored, typical little coon who blacks my shoes every morning. Neither is fit to perform the supreme function of citizenship." Unquote. From the soon-to-be governor of the state of Mississippi. Now, I got a better one. Benjamin Tillman, a sitting United States senator from the great state of South Carolina, says, quote, the action of President Roosevelt in entertaining that nigger will necessitate our killing a thousand niggers in the South before they will learn their place again, unquote. Huh. Now, this is like, okay. Now, there's, a, there's, there's the, the, the racist belief. Now, we, we know how often, the, how often the racists put these at, put these attitudes into action, especially in the, in the South. Now, the, the lynchings of black Americans in the, in, in the, in the Jim Crow South for roughly a, almost 100 years, from, 18, from the Reconstruction period to the triumph of the, in, what I think of as the individual rights movement, the, the, the so-called civil rights movement, but the individual rights movement for black Americans in the, in the 1960s, uh, the brutal lynchings and burnings are just, it's hair-raising that, that, that this kind of stuff happened in America. Just, here's an example. Sam Hose. This is a representative example of literally thousands. Born in 1875 in Georgia, lynched in 1899 in, in, uh, in Georgia. Now, Hose was a worker on a, 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 on a plantation, cotton farms. Uh, Hose requests time off from his employer because his mother's sick. He wants to go visit his, his mother. Heated argument ensues with his employee, the white guy, what was his name, Al, Al, Alfred, Alfred Cranford, who threatens to kill Hose, points a gun at him. Uh, Hose, thinking that Cranford intends to kill him, is working with an axe. He throws the axe at Cranford and kills him. Even though this is self-defense, <laughs> in 1899, Georgia, Hose knows he's going to be lynched if he's caught. He flees. And so... There's a, a, a massive manhunt for, you know, for, the, for the murderer, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the fervor builds for, for, for days. The rumor starts that Hose broke into the house and, and raped Cranford, Cranford's wife, that uh, there's, there's, uh, the Atlanta Constitution is, is a, a very respected newspaper, is you know, fanning the flames of, uh, of fear. When, by the time Hose is captured, the lynch mob has is, is grown to 2,000 people. Again, this is, this is typical. This is not atypical. Uh, the lynch mob has grown to 2,000 people. Uh, when, 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 it's, when, when the people hear about it in Atlanta that Hose has been captured, they rush out of churches and, and businesses and schools onto trains to go down so they could see, so they could see the lynching. Now, the news, this is from newspaper reports. This is not hearsay, anecdotal evidence, but newspaper reports, because the newspapers used to play this up in the South, and these murderers would pose with, with the lynch guy, take pictures of him, and keep him, keep him as souvenirs. They're gleeful, you know, in, in what they had done. According to the newspaper reports, 
Hose's ears, fingers, and genitals were cut off. The skin from his face was sliced off. His body was doused with kerosene. He was tied to a tree and burned alive. Members of the crowd cut off pieces of his body and kept them as souvenirs. W.E.B. Du, e. du Bois, a leading black writer and intellectual, and, and a few years later, one of the founders of the NAACP, was living in Atlanta at that time. He witnessed firsthand the furor o, o, over this, the, the hysteria, the, the untruths that were told, seeing res, respected, respectable, educated white folk rush out to get on trains from Atlanta to, to go to uh, 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 see Hoses lynching. Uh, du Bois heard that Hose's scorched knuckles were for sale at a local Atlanta grocery store. And seeing the, the, the f this fervent racism, Du Bois changed his mind. He had originally thought, because he'd, 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 he'd lived, I think, most of his life in the North, as I recall. He originally thought that this white racism in the South was mostly limited to the more uneducated uh, 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 whites, and that, that, and that the way to end it was to, was to, uh, um, you know, was to cooperate with more educated whites, the, better, the more rational, better whites, to, to, to bring an end to, to, to the, to the anti-black racism and the lynchings. And uh, seeing this, Du Bois realized that the, that the bigotry and the, the anti-black racism in the South was much deeper and much more widespread and, and, and much more of an intractable problem uh, than, than he had initially supposed. Now, some, some white uh, anti-lynching liberals, real liberals, you know, supporters of liberty in, in the North in Chicago hired a, a white detective, Louis Levin, uh, was hired privately to, to investigate uh, this incident. He, uh, Levin conducted numerous in interviews with eyewitnesses and, and, and locals and who, who obviously spoke to him anonymously. Uh, and and um, his report concluded that Hose acted in self-defense and the rape allegation was pure fiction to incite a lynching. In a separate investigation by another private white uh, detective, Mrs. Cranford was interviewed and she reported that Hose had one, never entered the house, Two had never touched her, and three had most likely acted in self-defense. Levin, in his report, concluded, quote, I made my way home to Chicago thoroughly convinced that a Negro's life is a very cheap thing in Georgia, unquote. Now, there are thousands of such cases recorded, never mind the ones that are unrecorded, but recorded in newspaper clippings throughout, throughout the Jim Crow South. Uh, Booker T. Washington staff at Tuskegee Geege Institute, starting in 1882, his librarians kept files of newspaper and magazine articles regarding black lynchings. Until, until 1962, published an annual tally of lynchings in the South. One, one writer called it a kind of ghastly Dow Jones ticker of race-driven murder. From 1882 to 1944, in the Tuskegee Files, actual newspaper clippings and with pictures and everything, 3,417 lynchings of innocent blacks who never went to trial. Uh, one of these, I'll just, I'll just give you one more example. Mary Turner, eight months pregnant. What, when, when was this? This was 1917 in, in Georgia, again in Georgia, uh, 1918 in Georgia. Her husband was lynched. He wasn't even accused uh, of, of a murder. Some, some other black kid was accused of the murder, but the manhunt was crazy and they, they, they lynched somebody. You know, it wasn't, even, it wasn't even suspected of being involved in, in, uh, in a killing. They, they, they lynched him. Uh, and this innocent guy, Mary Turner, eight months pregnant, obviously distraught at the lynching of her innocent husband, threatened the murderers with legal justice. <laughs> That's a joke. There's, no, no, there's not going to be any legal justice in Georgia in 1918. Nevertheless, the murderers, incensed that she would threaten them with legal justice, decided to teach her a lesson. They, they seized her, they, they tied her ankles together, they hung, hung her upside down from a tree, they doused her in gasoline, they set fire to her. Before she died, one of the thugs cut open her abdomen with a, with a hunting knife, the unborn infant fell out, they stomped the infant to death, and then they riddled Mary Turner's body with hundreds of bullets. Now, get this. From the Atlanta Constitution, subheaded this story. The subheading is, quote, fury of the people is unrestrained, unquote. That's the way the Atlanta Constitution reported it in 1918. Now, not to be outdone, the Associated Press wrote, quote, Mary Turner made unwise remarks about the execution, execution, not lynching. 
Mary, Mary Turner made unwise remarks about the execution of her husband, and the people, in their indignant mood, took exception to her remarks as well as her attitude, unquote. That's from the Associated Press. The NAACP did an investigation of the lynchings, turned over to the governor of Georgia a complete report identifying two of the instigators and 15 of the perpetrators. No legal charges were ever brought against anybody. Can go on, I think that's enough with the lynchings. Now, lynchings are not the only form of murder and violent physical assault directed against uh, black Americans during the Jim Crow era. The race riots against blacks were rampant, including in the North. In, in East St. Louis, Illinois, in Chicago, you know, the, the number of race riots in many cities, many in the South, some in the North, uh, uh, against blacks. Now, the Tulsa race riot is important, because I mentioned it before, the Greenwood district of Tulsa, a bustling black commercial center was burned to the ground, and essentially over nothing. And, and, you know, and, 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 that, and what happened was a, a young black kid, Dick Rowland, accidentally touches, probably accidentally touches a white girl uh, elevator operator named Sarah Page. She screams, the police are brought in, a lynch mob forms, the cops take the kid into protective custody. They barricade the whole top floor of the courthouse in Tulsa. The, uh, the sheriff tells the, the lynch mob outside that if you bust into the courthouse, you're going to be shot on sight. So the legal authorities at least protected you know, the, the kid in this case. But in Greenwood, there's a number of, of, of blacks who are, who are Army veterans uh, and, and, and served in the U.S. Army during World War I, had this funny idea that they were U.S. citizens and you know, uh, their rights should be upheld. Uh, they were terrified that the kid was going to be lynched. They, they were armed. They went to the courthouse to offer their services to the sheriff. The sheriff declined, said they weren't needed. The white lynch mob sees the armed black guys. An altercation ensues. Shots are fired. People are killed. Uh, the heavily outnumbered blacks retreat to Greenwood. A, a rolling gun battle ensues. A white mob enters Greenwood. Lots of people are shot. They, the upshot is they burn it to the ground. They burn Greenwood to the ground. Uh, God knows, no, no, nobody knows, no, nobody knows how many uh, people were killed. Dozens of whites, hundreds of blacks. Reports of the death toll vary, but a Red Cross social worker reports that up to 300 blacks were killed. Hundreds of people were admitted to the hospital, but mostly white, as both black hospitals were burned to the ground deliberately during the rioting. The bustling commercial district of Greenwood was destroyed. The residential area, over 1,200 homes were, were, were burned. Thousands of black citizens left uh, their homes and fled. Legally, no charges were ever filed against individual white rioters. Lawsuits against insurance companies for, for the homes and businesses of, of black Americans were uniformly unsuccessful. One result, the Ku, of, of the rights, the Ku Klux Klan appears in, in force in Oklahoma uh, for the first time. By the end of 1921, several months after the Tulsa race riots, Tulsa has now 3,200 Klan, official Klan members out of a population of 72,000. One more. <clears throat> I mentioned the East St. Louis, Illinois race riots of 1970. This was the one that, that Madam C.J. Walker was actively involved in, in, in protesting. Uh, there was, there was a, a silent protest parade in New York City of eight to 10,000 uh, black Americans protesting how many hundreds of, of black workers were killed in the race riots in East St. Louis, Illinois in 1970. Now, facing competition from black workers and hearing that black men and white women fraternized at labor meetings, white workers, some of them unions, uh, initiated attacks on blacks in, in May, June of 1917 that eventually escalated. In July 1917, thousands of armed white men marched into the black section of town. Get this, the first thing they did, they cut the water hoses of the fire department. Proceeded to burn the black neighborhood to the ground, shot blacks as they escaped the flames, and, and, and lynched numerous others. Roughly 100 to 200 black workers were, were murdered. That's more than 1,000 black homes were burned to the ground. 6,000 blacks left homeless after, the, after their homes were, were, were burned. Now, this is not atypical. So that's enough with the examples. Most Americans realized there was some horror, 
you know, during the Jim Crow era. I don't think, I, most, most Americans that I talk to don't recognize the extent of it. Uh, you know, the, 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 the full horror of, of, of this. Now, we saw the minimal condition for a persecuted minority to rise, you know, is individual rights. And you see what happens in its absence. Now, the, this, there's a conundrum here, right? The United States is the country that preeminently put into practice the principle of individual rights. Now, how is this possible? Now, this claim that the United States is preeminently the country that put into principle, that put into practice the principle of individual rights is true, insofar as it goes. But uh, it's not the full truth. Let's check this premise. Let's do what Ayn Rand taught us so brilliantly to do. Broaden our scope. See the big picture. Integrate. First of all, observe an important point here. The original U.S. mixed economy was not part capitalism, part socialism. That comes only in the 20th century. The original U.S. mixed economy was part capitalism and part slavery. And that's an important point. And I want to repeat this. The original U.S. mixed economy was not part capitalism, part socialism. That's a 20th century development under the influence of Marx. No, no. The original U.S. mixed economy was part capitalism and part race-based slavery. Now, second, a mixed economy is always based on a mixed philosophy. Without exception, a mixed economy of any kind is always based on a mixed philosophy. So the freer or capitalist element of America's original mixed economy was based on the founders' revolutionary principle that an individual's life belongs to the individual. And that's the foundation of the freer part of the America's original mixed economy. The slavery element in America's original mixed economy was grounded in race-based collectivism, in the belief in inherent black intellectual and moral inferiority. And notice, this is, this is, this is a conclusion held by racists on prejudicial grounds, on emotional grounds. And consequently, you know, any conclusion held on emotional grounds is, is impervious to, to evidence. So, so, let's go back. To, do you remember Vardaman, the soon-to-be governor of Mississippi? Remember what he said about Booker T. Washington? Well, if you don't, I'll refresh your memory, because I have it right here. Quote, from the future governor of Mississippi. Quote, I am just as much opposed to Booker T. Washington as a voter as I am to the coconut-headed, chocolate-colored, typical little coon who blacks my shoes every morning. Neither is fit to perform the supreme function of citizenship. Booker T. Washington is not fit to vote. Well, clearly, he's black. He can't possibly understand the complex issues of politics because he's, he's, he's a member of a, of a degraded, intellectually and morally inferior racial group. Booker T. Washington, one of the greatest educators this country has ever produced, was intellectually unfit to vote. Well, that tells us everything we need to know, right? Intrinsic black inferiority and white supremacy were fervently held beliefs of white racists, especially in the South. Not limited to the South, unfortunately, but especially in the South. Now, notice the profound collectivism of this. Yes, America is the country founded on the principle of individual rights, but notice the profound collectivism here. Blacks are not individuals, unique and unrepeatable, with conscious conclusions, moral principles, personal values volitionally chosen. No, no. First, foremost, always, they are members of a degraded racial group, intellectually and morally inferior, no matter the achievements of any member of this group. Similarly, the superiority of white people and the basis of white supremacy is not based in any volitional choice of an individual, but simply in racial membership, a member of the superior race. So observe the, the, the collectivism here as part of, the, uh, part of America's original, uh, original philosophy. It's, it's inescapable. 
Observe the clashing elements in this confused farrago of racist belief. The white race is superior. They're human. Consequently, white people have rights. Individual rights apply. But blacks are inferior. They're subhuman, and therefore, blacks have no rights. Individual rights, the principle of individual rights for white southern racists was part of an unstable mixture of ideas, and it was deeply based in, race, in racial collectivism. The South, upholding deeply entrenched racist views, was only partly American. Even the Virginians, I hate to say it, who contributed so much, were only partly American. In large part, was Patrick Henry like, I, 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 can't, I, can't, I can hear the clanking of the chains, you know, post slavery, you know, and I can't, I can't be enslaved. Held dozens of black slaves in the moment he uttered those immortal words. Uh, so the South, and even, even the Virginians, holding deeply entrenched racist views was only partly American. In large part, the Southern mixture perpetuated European feudalism, tying serfs to the land and to the landowners. The large part of the Southern mixture of the United States, of its original mixed econ economy, was collectivist. It was not individualist. A large part of it was medieval, was not enlightenment. A large part of it was conservative, not revolutionary or progressive. A large part of it was European not America. A large part of it perpetuated the ages-long history of warring national ethnic tribes, uh, and above all, white racism in the South trampled under its jackbooted heel most elements of individualism and individual rights for blacks, and left the southern states for three centuries, until the 1960s, a society more, more akin to a racist dictatorship than anything resembling America. The adherence of this mentality to this day, in 2015, 150 years after the end of the Civil War, choose to wave not the American, but the Confederate flag. And by the way, the Atlantic published a, a terrific essay just a few weeks ago about the Confederacy and the Confederate flag in the words of the people who founded the Confederacy. And across the board, not surprising from all these intellectuals and politicians who founded and supported the Confederacy and created the Confederate flag, were very clear what it stood for. For white supremacy, for legally enforced black degradation, and for race-based slavery. Let's make sure that every government institution in this country Federal, state, and local flies the American flag, not that goddamn Confederate flag. <laughs> now, until the, 19, the, the, the <laughs> until the 1960s, blacks in the southern states, where the overwhelming majority of black Americans lived, blacks in the southern states did not live in America. They lived in a brutal racist dictatorship a racist dictatorship that is alien to anything experienced by white Americans. Now, notice an, an important historical point. The South secedes from the Union 1860, 1861, after the election of, of, of President Lincoln and the, and, the, and the dominance of the Republicans in Congress. The South secedes, why, fundamentally? Because the principle of racist collectivism is fundamentally incompatible with America. That's why. The South secedes because the principle of racist collectivism is fundamentally incompatible with America, which is essentially ind individualism. Uh, the Civil War, triggered by the secession of a slave society, was a struggle of two applied philosophies, a nation of individualism versus a racist dictatorship. Notice in a way that both sides were right. If I put this hypothetically, the Southern racists were right. If, if the South was to remain a slave society, it had no place in the Union. But Lincoln and the Republicans were also right. Again, I'll put it hypothetically. If the South was to remain a slave society, it had no place in the Union. Both of them were right. If the South was to remain, uh, let's put this way, if Lincoln and Republicans, let me start over again. If the South was to remain a slave society, it had no place in the Union. Lincoln and the Republicans were also right. If the South was to remain in the Union, slavery had no place in it. The choice was stark. Either 
the South retains slavery and is out of the Union, or the South is in the Union and necessarily eliminates slavery. But slavery in America are incompatible. Now, the 13th Amendment ends slavery in 1865, but the struggle for the freedom of Southern blacks is only, is only continuing. This struggle triumphs only in 1965, when an educated black leadership, made possible in part by Booker T. Washington establishing 5,000 uh, schools for blacks in the rural South, decades later uh, arises a, a, an educated black leadership that successfully battles the racists for the individual rights of black Americans. I think of this as the individual rights movement, the individual rights for black Americans. And thereby, uh, carrying forward for blacks, not merely the work of the Civil War and the 13th Amendment, but more fundamentally, the work of the War of Independence and the establishment of an individualist republic. Now, individual rights and capitalism are the solution. Without a doubt, Ayn Rand is, 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 has established this brilliant. Have blacks lived under it? That's an interesting question. Notice during the North's freest period, late 19th and turn of the 20th century, which in the Capitalist Manifesto I named the inventive period. It's not the Gilded Age, it's the inventive period. During the North's freest period, blacks overwhelmingly lived in the Jim Crow South. As blacks moved north in the 20th century, it was becoming a semi-socialist welfare state. U.S. blacks have hardly ever lived under, under individual rights and capitalism. Throughout U.S. history, different forms of statism have targeted black Americans. One. Slavery kept blacks in literal chains for 200 years. Two, Jim Crow laws, brutal racist violence, lynchings, race riots, kept blacks subjugated for another century. Three, the post-1960s Marxist intellectuals and politicians zeroed in on poor blacks as their target audience. It was Walter Williams saying that Washington's welfare pimps have seduced people onto the dole. Now, people have free will. I get that. And if somebody goes on welfare, they've chosen that, and that's a mistake. Nevertheless, the welfare state is pernicious as hell, not just to the producers who finance it, but to the people who are suckered onto it. Uh, because the welfare state, what does the welfare state actually do? It puts perverse financial incentives in service of men's most irrational premises. That's what the welfare state does. It puts perverse financial incentives in service of men's most irrational premises. The welfare state and its philosophy of financial, moral, psychological dependence on the state contributed enormously to a widespread uh, d destruction of the black family, uh, which had not existed prior to the, the mid-1960s. The, the illegitimacy rate amongst black Americans wasn't any higher than amongst any other group. Now, I don't even know what the number is. It's off the charts. Children being raised in homes with no fathers, harmful to the girls, and is devastating to the boys. Now, there are degrees of evil. The racist dictatorship of the South, even under slavery, never approached the Nazi communist degree of oppression. Slavery, although horrendously evil, is not mass murder. It's not, there's, there's no, the Nazis are, America is not Germany. It was never Germany. America is not Russia. America is not China. Uh, according to Rudolf Rommel in his book, Death by Government, the Nazis murdered 21, roughly 21 million people. The Soviets, over 60 million. The Chinese under Mao, over 70 million. This was not the United States. There were degrees of evil. Hank Reardon thinks and Atlas shrugged about inches of evil. There were degrees of evil. Slavery, although horrendously evil, is not genocide. It's not mass murder of tens of millions of people. The Jim Crow South, brutally oppressive, was still, as bad as it was, and we gave some of the examples, was still sufficiently free, wasn't it, for Booker T. Washington to achieve at a very high level in Alabama, for George Washington Carver, similarly in Alabama, to achieve at a very high level, for Tuskegee Institute in Alabama to flourish, for the establishment, it was free enough for the establishments of thousands of black schools, uh, and, for the and, for the, and for the rise of an educated black leadership, and for the triumph of the individual rights movement for black Americans uh, in the 1960s. The welfare state, although pernicious as hell, still leaves individuals free to choose. And there are people like Ben Carson, the man I hope is the next president of the United States, who comes out of Detroit in the 1950s, 
and poverty, a broken home, if, if I recall, uh, becomes one of, the, one of the great brain surgeons in the world, a pioneer in brain surgery techniques for, uh, uh, for children, uh, who's written uh, several books. Uh, people like Ben Carson under the welfare state could still choose and their families can still choose full-time employment over, over permitting themselves to be seduced onto the dole. So uh, notice that even at its worst, in this racist dictatorship under slavery and, and mi in a more mitigated form under the Jim Crow laws, there was still an American element here. There was still some individualist element here. There was never government-sanctioned, institutionalized murder of millions and millions of human beings. The United States is not Germany. It's not Russia, and it's not China. Still, despite that, degrees of evil, still, a very strong case can be made that American blacks have never lived under a pronounced element of individual rights and capitalism, have never lived under the pronounced element of, of individual rights and capitalism that many American whites have historically. So that the achievements then of these great black heroes, of Sarah Breedlove, Madam C.J. Walker, of Booker T. Washington, the achievements of Tuskegee Institute, of George Washington Carver, you know, of the Greenwood District of Tulsa, of the black business community of Durham, North Carolina, the achievements of Dr. Ben Carson, of Thomas Sowell, and Walter Williams, and Condoleezza Rice, and Clarence Thomas, and many others, have been in the teeth of enormously and intensely powerful social opposition. This is both inspiring and depressing, all rolled up into one. Now, let's conclude here. The, my, Ayn Rand established brilliantly, the mind is mankind's tool of survival. Notice, slavery utterly suppressed the black mind for 200 years. Racism, Jim Crow laws, lynchings, uh, brutal physical assault didn't suppress it, but discouraged it uh, harshly for another century. The welfare state and its philosophy of, of moral, psychological, financial dependence discourage, discourages black intellectual development in yet another form. Now, the solution for blacks and for all Americans was provided by Ayn Rand. One, establish a culture of reason that glorifies the human mind regardless of race. The inventive period, uh, Galt's Gulch, the Enlightenment period, with, minus the racism. Establish a culture of reason that glorifies the human mind regardless of race. Two, institute a politics of individual rights that protects the right to life of all Americans regardless of race. And then stand back and appreciate the outpouring of genius of the Madam C.J. Walkers, of the Booker T. Washingtons, the George Washington Carvers, the Ben Carsons, et al., that will transfigure not merely black life, but, but everyone's life in the United States and around the world. How much more advanced would not only black culture be, but would American culture in general be if black minds, millions of them, had not been suppressed or, or subjugated for centuries? See, then we do that, establish a, a culture of reason regardless of race, glorifying the mind regardless of race, and a politics of individual rights, protecting each individual regardless of race, right to their own life, right to their own mind, right to their own thinking. If we do that, then America, already the greatest country in the history of the world, will have fulfilled the promise of its revolutionary founding, and then America will become even greater. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. So this is my first Ocon, so maybe the Kuhn one is an anomaly, but I'm curious of your opinion. Why don't we see more uh, black representative here? Where are the leading black intellectual speakers in the conference? Uh, specifically, I'm curious, is somebody like Thomas uh, Sewell ever invited to speak here? Uh, uh, is he involved with ARI at all? Uh, what about uh, Ben Carson? Just curious to hear your thoughts on that. Well, the, question, the question is, uh, if, I, if I understood, the question is where are the, the black objectivists and, and, and black speakers at this conference? Is that, is that, was that the question? So, uh, yeah, I'm just curious. Right. Uh, okay. If there are some that just happen not to be here, I, I'm, I'm new to their yeah, I don't know. Here, so, I don't know the yeah. answer. I don't know the answer to that yeah. question. But I think it's a. But I think it's a good question, and we could certainly speak to the hierarchy at ARI um, and see if uh, if Thomas Sowell has been invited to speak here. Cause he, I certainly think he should be. See if Walter Williams has been invited to speak here. I certainly think he should be. 
you know, see if Condoleezza Rice or Clarence Thomas or, uh, or Ben Carson or, 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 you know, any number of other black intellectuals, Larry Elder, off the top of my head, uh, John McWhorter. Uh, there's, there's not a lot of black objectivists, unfortunately, but there's certainly any number of brilliant black individuals who support individual rights and free markets who would be great speakers here. Right? So I certainly, I certainly agree with that, uh, but I don't know the answer to, to why that is. But you raise a good question. I will ask and find out. Yes, this, this pretty girl here. <laughs> Andy, um, considering that black rights are protected today, and um, considering that the black condition in the United States is dramatically improved to what you have described, why do you suppose so many people seem to hold up what I consider embarrassments like Sheila Jackson Lee, Jesse Jackson, um, Al Sharpton, instead of people like the Thomas Souls and the Ben Carsons of the world? Why don't they hold those folks up as their leaders instead of these other folks that I Yeah, mentioned. good question. The question is, given that um, black ad advance in the United States uh, is, is, has been great, is over 50% over, over of, of black Americans are, are, are middle class, and, and you see, you've seen the rise of an, uh, an educated and affluent black middle class in this country, which is a great thing. Why do so many intellectuals, politicians uphold as, you know, as, as black leaders, leaders of the black community, you know, frauds like Jesse Jackson, charlatans like Al Sharpton, why, you know, why isn't Ben Carson more, more widely recognized? Uh, why, why met Clarence Thomas, uh, you know, who, who's, uh, who, who's a brilliant uh, black uh, judge, deserves on, deservedly on the Supreme Court, he's, he's an admirer of Ayn Rand, you know, why, why, why aren't you know, Thomas Sowell, Walter Williams, people, people like that, upheld as, as, as the, the leaders of the black community, which they should be. And I think, you know, speaking of Clarence Thomas, one image comes to mind that I think answers that question. When he was appointed to the Supreme Court, did anybody remember the cover of Mother Jones magazine with Clarence Thomas depicted as a lawn jockey? You know, hold, hold, holding a lantern and, and the, you know, and the, and the, the headline that Clarence Thomas, you know, lawn jockey to the far right. Am I the only one who remembers that? I guess so. Oh, you, you could look it up, as they say. This is the information age. Uh, you know, and some, some black leftist, right, I forget her name offhand, Juliette Malveaux, was that her name or something like that? You know, said that she hoped Mrs. Thomas fed him lots of eggs and bacon and stuff so his arteries filled with cholesterol and he died of a heart attack. Uh, this is, the, the point being, that what's the dominant political philosophy of American culture? It's Marxism in some form. It's sem uh, maybe in a diluted form of the semi-socialist welfare state, but it's, it's Marxism. And so and even, in, in, even in a diluted form, Marxism, uh, the stench of it can be, can be smelled all over, all over the country. Um, and from a Marxist standpoint, all those, all those leftist, race-baiting, semi-socialist, Welfare status, you name, would 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 gain credibility uh, 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 amongst people in the country. And the, Ben Carson, who's a legitimate hero, a towering figure, is 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 not recognized. I mean, 90% of, of black voters today vote vote Democrat for the last 50 years. The Democrats were always the party of slavery, the party of Jim Crow, the party of lynchings the party of the Ku Klux Klan. The Republicans were the party uh, that ended slavery, that opposed Jim Crow, that opposed the lynchings. Uh, it was, it, the Republicans were, the, were always the party that, that uh, were responsible for, for, for more for, for the upholding and protection of, uh, of individual rights. But nobody in the country seems to remember that anymore. The leftists have done a great job of dumbing down the American educational system. No, no, nobody, nobody knows American history. And the Democrats, although they've changed their form, the Democrats are not racists anymore in that way. Now they're Marxists. They're not fighting race war anymore. They're fighting class war. They've shifted their form of collectivism. And so they're still harming blacks, even if they claim to want to help blacks. Now they're still harming blacks in the form of the welfare state. But the, as welfare statists, they can now pose as, you know, given the, the, the prevalence of altruism, in the, in, in the culture, they compose as, you know, the heroes who are trying to get us all to sacrifice for the little guy, for the poor, for the, for the oppressed racial minorities. And the American people have been sold a bill of goods. And in a word, the answer to your question is Marxism. Marxism is responsible for that. 
America is not Germany, my friend. I know. Thank you for the uh, <laughs> reminder. Um, Andrew, uh, very, very interesting talk. Uh, I know very little about history of, of black America. Is there any reading that, that you could recommend? But, but my, my actual question is, uh, you mentioned all the horrendous injustices to the, that blacks had to live under, you know, the, the lynchings and, and all of that. Uh, I, I wonder, uh, was there ever such a thing as, as, a, as, a, as a, like an underground self-defense organization, like, you know, that blacks uh, 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 had, you know, it's simply to fight back. I mean, not that they would have had a chance, but just in, in sheer yeah. self-defense. Philip, that's a good question. I have two good questions. Uh, yes and yes. Uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you some, some uh, references in just a minute. But yeah, do you remember, does anybody remember here? I, I'm losing confidence in this audience. Nobody remembers that cover of Mother Jones magazine. But uh, does anybody remember the uh, Condoleezza Rice's stated reasons for supporting the Second Amendment rights? She said that, you know, she, she grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, and the racist thugs were burning down black churches and black homes and everything. And she said her father and members of the black community had, had rifles and shotguns, and they were able to, in, in some cases, to defend the, the church and defend their homes, you know, and their businesses against the, against the Klan and, and, and those racist thugs. In some cases, they were able to do it successfully. They weren't going to get any help from the local or even the state governments, but very often the the, 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 the government officials either belong to the Klan or at least you're sided with the Klan. So yeah, there are numerous instances you know, of, of, of black, of armed blacks successfully defending their property against the, against the, the night riders, against the racist thugs. And by the way, not to, not to imply that all white Southerners were, were bigots, there were organizations of white Southerners who, who politically got involved, women in particular, but sometimes men, end the lynching, you know, end the lynching movements that recognize the horrors you know, of, uh, of, 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 the way, of, of the way the clan type mentalities, you know, murdered innocent blacks without ever going to, tr going to trial. So, there, yes, there were, there were examples of, 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 of blacks, armed blacks who successfully defended themselves against the racists. There were examples of white Southerners who, who in the days of slavery, were abolitionists. In the days of the Jim Crow persecution, uh, you know, politically were active, voicing their, 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 their desire to end the, end the lynchings. And regarding... Uh, books, yeah, there was, if you want to read some of the history here, Leon Litwack wrote a book. Can, can you spell? Litwack, yeah, L-I-T-W-A-C-K, Trouble in Mind, Black Southerners in the Age of Jim Crow. Trouble in Mind, Black Southerners in the Age of Jim Crow. I got these books from Amazon. Uh, Philip Dre, D-R-A-Y, Philip Dre. At the hands of persons unknown, the lynching of black America. Philip Dre, at the hands of persons unknown, the lynching of black America is very good. And one last one, Alan Trelease, T-R-E-L-E-A-S-E, -E -E, Alan Trelease, White Terror, the Ku Klux Klan Conspiracy and Southern Reconstruction. Trelease is T-R-E-L-E-A-S-E, -E, White Terror the Ku Klux Klan conspiracy and Southern Reconstruction. And by the way, while we're on that topic, a number of Americans mistakenly think that the first terrorist assault in this country was 9-11 or maybe the 1995 Oklahoma City, City bombings. No, the Ku Klux Klan was a terrorist organization. There's that, those white racist thugs were terrorists. The sole purpose of the terror, of the lynchings and the burnings and everything, was to keep the black man subjugated. What did Senator Tillman say? Because President Roosevelt had Booker T. Washington to dinner at the White House, we will have to, have to kill a thousand of them niggas to, to make sure they know their place again. The whole purpose of the terror, that's a quote, by the way, I don't go around using that language. Uh, uh, it's not funny. The whole purpose of the Klan's terror was to keep the black race subjugated. They had to know their place. So, no, the, the Klan and, and similar white racist organizations were terrorist organizations, and these were murderous terrorist assaults. So. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you, Anu. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>